a background on topics that are both interesting and relevant for current research, um, and that we are all experts in. Right? So I think the idea is that if, if you get ready, for example, if you want to do a PhD in this field, or if you just want to know more, the topics we'll cover will be quantum thermodynamics, which Ralph will start with, uh, how to make quarks with quantum systems, quantum quarks and the limits in them, and also, um, what else do we have? <laughs> learning theory, so quantum learning theory, Marco will explain more about this, uh, and then we'll, I'll talk about foundations, puzzles, paradoxes, and logic with, with quantum theory. Right, that's it. And <laughs> in terms of schedule, like I told you in the email, so Ralph will start, and then it will be a bit of which, depending more or less in well, depending on our availability. So we will tell in advance. And yeah. we're streaming live every lecture on the Zoom room that's on that's uh, on Moodle and also on YouTube. I'll make sure that this is working today, so hopefully it's all for the best. So uh, we very much welcome questions during the lecture and after yes. the lecture, so. Indeed. Uh, yeah, and I'll leave you with Ralph. Thanks, Lydia. Um, ah, there we go. Ooh. Right, this is a uh, good volume? Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, another thing to say is that at the moment on the Moodle, you will see the lecture notes from last year that I wrote for, for quantum thermodynamics. And the course that I will do this year, I, I basically will try and improve upon last year, but essentially the content is the same. Um, as I go through the weeks, if I add something in the lecture that was not in the last year's lecture notes, I will update them and you will get an email when I, when I do so. But for now, you could just use uh, last year's lecture notes to sort of go through the stuff uh, in detail, uh, what's done in the lecture. Very good. OK, so let me begin. Um, thermodynamics is going to be sort of the first five to six lectures of the course, because uh, the plan currently is that when Lydia takes over to do resource series, they will also deal a lot with, with thermodynamics, but also more general. Um, OK, so let's start with thermodynamics. This is a very broad field, and depending on who you ask, you will get a different um, answer as to what is the focus of thermodynamics. But I would say that one of the ways of understanding thermodynamics is the, to understand complex and disordered systems for which you only have only a few global parameters. So you know, if I take the classic example, I have a big box in which there's a gas. In fact, the number of parameters to completely describe the system is is huge, it's 10 to the order of 23, 24 parameters. I need the position and velocity of every system. And this is if I already know its masses, for example. But what thermodynamics can do is it can tell us, well, even if the system is allowed to be on its own and be completely disordered, if you were to know just the temperature of the system, the pressure and the volume, you could already understand quite a lot of the properties of the system. You could understand what would happen if you attach it to a piston and try and do something with it. Which brings us to the second part of thermodynamics, which is to actually design and control such systems. Now that you, you know that even with a few global parameters, you can in fact understand the system, then what you would like to do is then use these parameters to, to make useful things out of them. So a very, uh, one of the diagrams that I would expect you would have seen somehow while doing classical thermodynamics is the idea of constructing, for example, an engine or a machine out of, in, in classical thermodynamics. And you, broadly speaking, you will have something that acts as a, a source of heat, a source of energy. Um, so I will just label this with TH to say that it's some hot, hot temperature system. And you know that um, there is a flow of heat from this to another temperature. At this time, I will write it as TR to sort of signify room temperature or environment. Yes? Larger? OK. Um, and the key is that I put in something in between, which I can call the machine in general, that is somehow use the heat flow between these two systems to give me something useful of the form, well, I will label this W now, um, to represent work. So this is somehow a very classical way of writing you know, in thermodynamics what I do. I have a hot bath. I have a room temperature bath or an environment where I can throw out heat. I have some clever machine in between that uses the heat flow between these. And the heat flow is really from hot to room or to a colder temperature to generate some, something useful for me, so some work, for example. 
OK, so um, right. The, this is somehow the, the principle behind everything, uh, all sorts of thermal machines, including sort of the engine in your car, for example, that would, uh, that would run basically on this principle. You burn fuel to generate heat. You dissipate energy to the environment, and that's why the engine is hot. But you have the engine, which is rotating in between, and that drives, like, moves your car. OK, so in fact, the engine is not a random example, because this is really how thermodynamics sort of sprouted out in the 18th and 19th centuries out of trying to understand steam engines. And so there were a number of realizations. The, the first realization was the fact that there are these, these things, different forms of energy. So you know you have work where you raise a weight or you, you drive a, a truck or a car. But you also have heat, where, is, where you just burn something uh, in a fire and you, you get some sort of energy. And so this leads to a number of concepts. So the first concept is that of energy. And here you have the first law of thermodynamics, which states that actually energy is this globally conserved quantity. I can convert between different types of energy, but in fact, the total amount remains the same. Of course, energy is not the whole picture, because clearly, when I raise a weight and, and store energy in this form, this is much more useful than when I burn something in a fire. Because in one case, the, the energy is very ordered, and now I can lower the weight and do something very useful. Whereas with a fire, even though I know I can do useful stuff with it, a lot of the heat is just lost into the environment. So that led to this concept of different types of energy, some of which are ordered, some of which are disordered. And this eventually leads to the concept of entropy, which is sort of relates um, the amount of uncertainty you have in the state of a system. If you have no uncertainty of a, in the state of a system, then the energy stored in the system is very useful because it's, you know exactly which energy level it is in. But if, on the other hand, you have a, just you, you burn something and you heat a gas, then the energy is quite disordered. There is still some useful energy, but you know it's, it's disordered. So this leads to entropy and heat, which also corresponds to then the second law of thermodynamics, this idea that some sort of notion of disorder is always bound to increase whenever you do, whenever you transfer energy between systems. And of course, the third thing, and actually I would have put it in between here, is the notion of equilibrium. You also know that if you have two systems that you, you know, are different, well, I say temperature, but at that time, you would just say, well, some, one of them feels different than the other. And the, the feeling that's different is that, in some cases, energy wants to flow. All right, maybe I close the door. No. I can have two examples of a system that I touch with my hand, and in one case, I feel like energy is flowing from my hand to that system, like heat has been taken away, and in the other case, I feel like the opposite. And so this gives rise to the notion of temperature. And the notion of equilibrium. So two, two systems are in equilibrium thermodynamically if no heat flows from one to the other in, in, on average. And this happens, this, this notion of equilibrium actually defines temperature because then we say, well, if the temperatures of the system are equal, then nothing will flow. If the temperature of one is greater, then heat will flow from that one uh, to the other one. And this is related to the zeroth law. OK, so this is sort of an overview of the basic notions of classical thermodynamics. But now I can ask, well, what happens if I consider quantum systems? You know, in the case of my steam engine, I have some big fire that's going on in somewhere in the engine. I have this complicated system of pistons, and I have the environment outside in which I throw away uh, heat, and then I get work out of it. But can I do this with quantum systems? So for instance, if I have, for example, just a collection of qubits. So I have one qubit, and I will use this sort of, I'll explain this sort of notation. Essentially, what I'm doing is when I write this, I'm I'm essentially writing the two states of a qubit. And I'm writing this in the energy eigenbasis. So this is like the ground state at E0, and this is the excited state at E1. So I have a, the simplest possible quantum system. It can only be in one of two states, or of course, the superposition of the two. And it's Hamiltonian. I can schematically write as well. I have a ground state energy level, and I have an excited state energy level. And the qubit state can actually be, it can be the ground state, it can be the excited state, it can be a mixture of the two, it can also be a superposition. But for now, this is a, one of the qubits. Then I can imagine I have another qubit here with a different Hamiltonian. So I can call this 0h, 1h. This will be 0r. 
E1R, you know, with a different Hamiltonian now, this is E1H, e not h E0R, E1R, and then, bigger, I'm going to fill the board very quickly. Uh, e one H. Oh yes, actually that was way too small. E one R. E not R. So I want these to somehow I can connect these now schematically to some temperature, so okay, let me differentiate between the classical thing that I was writing before. You know, similar to the case of classical thermodynamics, this qubit is connected to some sort of an environment at a hot temperature. I connect this one as well to some sort of environment that is at room temperature. What these couplings and stuff are, this is a very loose description because I want to introduce sort of the topic to you. So all of these will be fleshed out with more detail uh, later. But then what I have is I have a system in which I want to store work. So for example, this could be a system, uh, a ladder, for example, with some ground state, and then excited state, and so on and so forth. It could be a finite ladder, or it could be unbounded, so I could have a harmonic oscillator. And my goal then would be, well, can I, just like in the case of classical thermodynamics, engineer some sort of interaction between these system, so some sort of way to make energy flow from the hot environment through this qubit and to the room environment in such a way that it also raises up the ladder. So if my state was, for example, in the second excited state of the ladder, I wanted to go to the third excited state and so on using the flow of energy through these systems. So for example, one such transition that would do the following is I would like, for example, one hot, zero room, and say n of the weight to go to zero hot, one room, n plus one of the weight. So this is a typical thing. This qubit loses energy, the room qubit gains energy, the ladder moves up. And then these two qubits can get reset to the environment and then this process can repeat, and in the repetition of this process, you move up the ladder uh, continuously. So this is sort of an example and of what one would try and do in quantum thermodynamic machines, just like in the classical case. Once again, all of this will have more detail in it. OK, so once you start working with these things, you can now ask the same questions. What happens to the laws of thermodynamics? Are they the same in, in quantum thermodynamics as in the classical case? Are they constrained a bit more? Are they constrained a bit less? So that is one sort of way to go, just try and reproduce as much as you can. But the second way to go is to say, well, quantum, thermo quantum machines, uh, quantum systems have things that classical systems do not have, such as entanglement. This is a form of correlation between systems that is stronger than classical correlations. So if I construct a machine like this that has this sort of you know, transformation, then when I look at the state, the joint state of the hot room and work system, maybe I see entanglement between the three. And then I can ask, well, can I use thermodynamics on the one hand to create such quantum properties, such as entanglement? And on the other hand, I can also ask the reverse question, can I use special quantum properties, such as entanglement, to sort of affect how my machines work, to sort of improve them in a, in a manner? So this is sort of the type of um, investigations we would do at, at the basis of quantum thermodynamics, to reproduce classical thermodynamics, to make interesting machines in the quantum case, and to ask how the laws of thermodynamics and the interaction with quantum properties would look in, in, in quantum thermal machines. OK, is there any question about this? All right, good. OK, so uh, to continue, I would say just the overview. There are, in general, two sorts of directions that one can approach um, quantum thermodynamics with. And they loosely will correspond to the approach that I will use for the first few lectures. And then the approach that I will also refer to the other approach. But Lydia, with, Reese, with her resource series lectures, will sort of go in the other direction. And so the first approach is 
I would say the um, con oh, no. constructivist approach. And in this approach, what I would do is really, if I want to study some thermodynamic process, I will actually design the machine that actually does that process. So what I just did um, here, like writing down something that would look like a quantum engine, is an example. I'm not going to design, uh, talk about a quantum mechanical engine in an abstract term. I'm actually going to say, well, I have a qubit. This is the spectrum of the qubit. This is the particular interaction I want to engineer. And this is what it does. So this is a constructivist approach. And the advantage of such an approach is that it gives explicit construct explicit machines for tasks. So it gives explicit, um, let's say, protocols or tasks. So this is sort of the advantage of it. You know if you've constructed a thermal machine that does a task, then you know that task is possible. But the, the disadvantage of it is that if you don't have a thermal machine to do a thermodynamic task, that doesn't mean that it's impossible. You just haven't constructed the machine yet. So it doesn't sort of exhaust the possibilities of what you can do because it's, it's quite explicit. I, I actually designed something for a particular scenario. And on the other hand, you can have, I would call this the resource theoretic approach. And in that, what you do is you essentially you define the entire theory on abstract level. You say, well, this theory can have any of this set of states. So whatever machine I design, it can be it can have anything from this set of states, and I it can also involve anything from this set of operations. So I have a like sets of of states and operations that are allowed. And then I ask, well, can you tell me everything that is possible or anything that is impossible with this theory? So the good part about such an approach is that what it does is it gives you sort of the boundaries, so the impossibility, which the more technical term is no-go um, theorems. So it tells you the boundary of what you can do in thermodynamics. If, if you construct a resource theoretic approach and you say, well, actually, I know that this is impossible, then you know that no matter what machine you design, you will not be able to do it. And on the other hand, the disadvantage is exactly the advantage of the first approach, which is that um, it does not, does not provide a construction. And the reason this, is, this second disadvantage is, is important is because sometimes I can have a statement in the resource theoretic approach that says, well, if I have a qubit and I'm allowed to connect it to an environment of, you know, of a certain temperature, then I know that I can construct an operation that can get this qubit to another state. However, I have no idea how complicated the operation has to be or how large the environment has to be. Maybe the operation is going to be a joint unitary operation on my qubit and like 1,000 qubits from the environment, and that's the only way I can do it. In which case, you would say, well, actually, this is a very difficult operation, even though it's possible. So the advantage of the first one is that actually I go, I can actually see the details of what operation I'm doing. As the advantage of the second one is it tells me straight off the bat whether it's possible or not. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, any questions? Great. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually start now with the technical part of the lecture. Lydia? It's okay that it's on top. Okay? That's right. OK, very good. So let's begin. Um, in order to do quantum thermodynamics, we're going to have to talk about quantum states. So I expect already that you've been introduced to the formalism of quantum states. The two main ways of oh, this is irritating. Never mind. The two main ways of talking about quantum mechanical states, the traditional ways you say, well, if I have a system S, this is the usual way of denoting. 
sorry, bigger system, then I can write a pure state of that system as some ket vector s that belongs to some Hilbert space, and that's the Hilbert space of the system. So this is the usual way of, of writing it. And of course, I can, for any Hilbert space, pick an orthon orthonormal basis and write it as psi s in that basis is the sum over the elements in that basis. Let's say i, ci, phi i. And this, if this is a basis, it means that phi i phi j, the scalar product, is delta i j. So it's 1 if they're the same, 0 otherwise. And it's, it's a complete basis, so the entire Hilbert space is covered by this. Yeah, so this is standard quantum mechanics. Um, you also know, and um, if this is not the case, please go through the lecture notes a little bit because this will, is done a bit more in detail there. But if you have a state of a system that, in fact, was created probabilistically, so, you know, I, I can imagine that I have... Um, I have a machine that s spits out with probability p is equal to one half psi, but it also splits out with another half the probability, another well psi one, and then let's say psi two with equal probability. Then the way to describe this state is not as a pure state anymore because psi one is a pure state, psi two is a pure state, but the statistics of measurements that I do is going to be half of the time from psi one and half of the time from psi two. And so the way to do that then is to say, actually, I have a density matrix rho of the system. Um, and that is written as, uh, let's say, rho, something like this. Psi 1, psi 1 with the half plus half psi 2, psi 2. So just a show of hands for how many of you... Um, I've not sort of dealt with the notion of a density matrix in any version before. No, everybody has. Very good. That's good to know. Okay, good. So, okay, so a density matrix is written as a mixture of states. Rather than being a vector in a Hilbert space, it actually looks like a linear operator on that Hilbert space because um, these can be written as vectors. These can be written as matrices, which I will get to a, into in a bit. But Again, just as in the case of a pure state, I can write a density matrix in a basis. So I can always write it as rho is equal to sum over ij, rho ij, phi i, phi j. And the way to construct the rho ij is I can write this as so um, the identity operator, rho s, the identity operator. The identity operator, I can split via the spectral theorem as i phi i phi i, then I have rho, sorry, phi j phi j. So for ease of writing and not getting slowed down, if, if it's very clear what system I have, I will sometimes not put in the subscripts. And I hope this is all right because there's only the system right now, so it doesn't matter. So I have these, oh, sorry, mix with the j. This is I suggest this is a way to write down the identity matrix. It's of course, the spectral theorem. And then, at the end, this is now going to be equal to sum over ij. These elements, phi i, rho, phi j, phi i, phi j. So it's just rearrangement. And so this is the density matrix element, rho ij. OK. And um, yes, so as in the case of vectors, which you can write as column vectors, in the case of density matrices as well, you can do the same. So I can now write this as a matrix where I label all of the columns by the phi i. So here are all the, um, sort of, sorry, the rows by the phi i and the columns by phi j. And each of the elements here are rho ij. So, f so the so for instance, I can have rho uh, two one here, which is attached to the element. Let me write this bigger. It's attached to the element uh, two and one there. Okay, so this is just a way of writing 
uh, density matrices as very useful. OK. However, because we're doing thermodynamics, the most important quantity is energy. And so what we really want, more than almost exclusively, actually, um, is to be able to write the density matrix that tells us something about the energy of the system. So in order to do this, what I do is, well, I look at the Hamiltonian of the system. This is the most important quantity. This tells me what the energy levels in the Hilbert space are. Um, and so I can write any Hamiltonian as some sort of sum, the energy eigenvalues times the projectors on that energy eigenstate. So any, any um, observable or real uh, observable can always be written in this form, whether it's position, momentum, um, energy. Of course, sometimes it's a sum, sometimes it's an integral if you have continuous variables. But for energy, I can do this. OK, and so the most important thing for me when I look at the density matrix of a system in thermodynamics is to be able to write it in this basis. So I really want to write rho um, of the system is equal to sum over, let's say, mn, rho mn em en. Okay. So in spite of the fact that you can write a density matrix in whatever basis you like, it will always turn out in thermodynamics that this is the most important one. And uh, I personally, in the first part of the course, will be working almost exclusively in that basis. Um, right. OK, so some terminology now. Um, the lowest EM, um, we usually denote as E0, and we call it the ground state. OK, so the ground state is the actual state, the vector E0. Um, and again, the thing about energy is that um, because, well, in, in all of those diagrams that I wrote, it really is the difference in energy that matters. Whenever I make, so for example, if I ask you how much energy changes in that transition that I wrote up there, you would have to take the difference between the excited and the ground states of the hot, of the room, and of the ladder. And because of this, because it's always the difference in energy and transition between energy levels that matters, it means that if I push the entire energy scale down by any constant, it doesn't really matter because it's the relative energy that is actually going to turn up in any, any physical observation. So what this means is that I can always really choose this to be equal to 0 without actually losing any physics. And this is what we will do in general. So the ground state is just the 0 energy state in general here. OK. So that is the ground state. Um, then there's a the notion of degeneracy, which is Em equals to En, where M not equal to N. So I have two, I mean, this is really degeneracy just as in linear algebra. I have degenerate eigenvalues. That means there are multiple states in the Hilbert space that actually have the same energy eigenvalue. And so I have degeneracy. I can also talk about the degenerate subspace, which would be the, the space spanned. So let's just say spanned by, by degenerate states. OK. So degenerate states. Um, right. And then the final part of the terminology is, let me write now, imagine that this is the density matrix. So these are rho, so this is rho 0, 0, dot, dot, dot. I have a rho n, 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 n. Then I have um, aha, rho, let's say, 0, n. Um, I call these the diagonal elements, the populations. Because in what they refer to, when you write this in a density matrix form in the energy eigenbasis, is they refer to the probability that if you measured in this basis, you would find it in the state n. So the diagonal element on the nth basis is basically that probability. Because if I put this into the, a measurement projector en, en, and I look at the answer I get, I'm going to get the whatever element I put here. And so I will write them as populations, and I will actually call them a lot of times pn, so as 
opposed to rho nn. So it's just pn are the populations on the on the diagonals. Um, and these I will call one of two things. So I will call them coherences if em is not equal to en. So let's let's write this as some general okay rho m n. Sorry, this is getting smaller. But otherwise, if not, I, I don't call them anything special. They're just the off-diagonal off -diagonal elements. So in other words, diagonal elements are populations, and off-diagonal elements, if they involve two states that do not have the same energy, we call coherences. And if they involve uh, if they involve stuff with the same energy, then I don't call them anything special. They're just off diagonal elements. Yes. So the coherences then depend on which. Well, in well, the thing is that now I'm working in the energy basis, so this is now in the energy basis. So the populations do not really depend on the basis anymore. Now, if I have degeneracies, then then this can change. Uh, it will within a degenerate subspace. I can choose multiple bases to to write the state because uh, if I have a degenerate subspace, then I can write a superposition of the states, and that's a new basis, and and it will be. And then the populations will depend on that. Um, but otherwise, if for non-degenerate spaces, they are independent of that. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Um, very good. And. So then, and the final thing to define at this point would be the notion of average energy, which is really the expectation value uh, of the operator HS on the system state rho s. So as an HS times rho s. Um, right, so th this is just a definition of the expectation value of, of energy. Um, but because of the way we've written everything in the energy eigenbasis, I can actually simplify this. So now I write this as trace of um, sum over n, en, 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 uh, sum over KL, I'm going to write now. KL, EK, EL. Right, and these two will create a delta NK, and these two, thanks to the effect of the trace operation, will create a delta, uh, let me write this bigger, NK, delta NL, which leads to, in the end, just a simple sum sum over n of rho n n e n, which just as notation change, I can write it as p n times e n. And you see somehow this, this is why it's neat to think of populations. Basically, if I have a certain population of being in the nth energy level, that is also a contribution to the average energy of that population times that energy value. Uh, 545, right. Still some time. Okay. So, I'm going to have to erase the first board. Now, the question one could ask is, well, why differentiate um, between states that are, oh, here it is, states that have the same energy and states that do not have the same energy. So, for example, some of the off-diagonal elements in the density matrix, I insisted we should call them coherences. Some of them I insisted we, we don't have to, depending on whether the energy was the same or not. And the reason for this comes from just the normal evolution of quantum uh, mechanical states in time. So, sorry, let me send this up. I can refer to it. Very good. So you know that um, 
a normal quantum mechanical state if I have hs and I have a state psi s, then if I evolve it for a time t, I will get, um, well, e to the i hs t acting on the state psi s. So this is just quantum mechanical evolution. Um, evolve, when you evolve Schrodinger's equation, this is what you get. Now, if I write psi s as before, as the sum over, let's say, now we work only in the energy eigenbasis, so I say um, Cn En, then this becomes equal to um, sum over N Cn e to the, oh, sorry, minus, very important, minus I En times T En. This is why solving Schrodinger's equation, um, diagonalizing that Hamiltonian is so important because once you have the energy eigenstates, then any evolution is just very simply evolve each energy eigenstate, keep the coefficients the same, and just add the phases that you get from time. Okay, so now imagine that I do this on a density matrix. So I had a density matrix that was some rho mn, and I have em en. Okay, and I ask now, well, what happens if I evolve this under time? So I'm going to write rho t here, and it, the answer is very simple. I evolve the ket like I would evolve an energy uh, eigenstate. I evolve the bra under the dual operation. So this em is going to get e to the minus i emt, this phase added on it, and the en is going to get e to the plus i ent added to it. So I, I mean, so this is what happens to a density matrix. And this is now sum over mn, rho m n, e to the minus i e m minus e n t e m e n. OK, so now what you see is every element of the density matrix potentially has a phase attached to it. But there are two classes of elements that are not going to have a phase attached to it. The first is if m is equal to n, then there is no phase, because e n minus, e e minus e n is 0, so there's just absolutely no phase. And what this means is that the populations have no phase. OK, that's the first thing. And the second thing is if, if e m is equal to e n, OK, and m not equal to n, to, otherwise it's just the first case anyway, then again there is no phase, which basically says degenerate states, degenerate states um, do not change the relative phase. Relative phase. OK, so at this stage, it would be useful to have an example, which I will put on the other side of the board. So imagine that I have the following Hamiltonian. H of the system is, is going to be a three-level Hamiltonian. So this is the state 0. 1 and 2, um, and the Hamiltonian is, well, there's no energy, so E0 is 0, and it just has the energy E for the state 1 and the same energy E for the state 2. So you see the purpose of the energy level diagram. By drawing this, I immediately say there's a ground state and there are two excited states that are degenerate. They have the same energy. Okay, so if I have that, and now I write down a de general density matrix in this basis, so I have three rows and columns, this is row 0, 0, row 1, 1, row 2, 2, row 0, 1, row 0, 2, row, uh, sorry, nope, 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 1, 0, 2, 0, 2, 1, row 
0, 1, row 0, 2, and row 1, 2. OK, so this, imagine that this is row 0. And what I'm going to do in green is write row at time t. Okay? What's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen to the diagonal elements. These off-diagonal elements between 1 and 0 states, because they do not have the same energy, they are going to evolve. So for example, in the case of e to the in the case of rho, let's say I put m is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1, I'm going to get e0 minus e1 here. So 0, 1, this is going to add a phase, e to the minus i, e0 minus e1 t, which, OK, I'm, I'm going to simplify this. Uh, e0 is 0, 0, e1 is just e. So this whole thing is going to become e to the i e t. The same way, this one is going to get the conjugate, e to the minus i e t. But the rest do not change. So this, whatever it is, it remains the same, so unchanged. Sorry, not 0, 2. What am I saying? Ah, made a mistake again. Sorry. This, this one also gets the same phase, e to the i e t, because 0 and 2 are of the same level. e to the minus i e t, because 0 and um, 2 are this different. But these are the ones. So this and this are unchanged. Because e1 and e2 are the same, and so they don't have any phase. OK, so this is why I said degenerate states do not change change relative phase. So whatever this element is, it could have a phase. It, it, does, it, it can be any complex number, well, up to the fact that this has to be a valid density matrix. So there can be a phase in there. It's just that in time, it's not going to change. Whereas the other elements that are between um, non-degenerate states, these will change the phase. Is this clear? All right. So okay. now, why is this important? This is important because of the following. So imagine that I have a state that I prepared in the laboratory. And I say, OK, I want to do something to the state. But um, before, I, after I prepare the state, I actually go out, have a glass of water, come back, and then I perform the operation on the state. Now, the problem is that in the time between, the state has actually evolved. If I do not know the exact time for which the state has evolved, I am not sure about what these elements are anymore. So I know what they started out as. but the effect of multiplying by such a phase is essentially to rotate in the complex plane. Because if I have a number somewhere in the complex plane, let's say this is rho, rho 0, 1 at t is equal to 0, what's going to happen as a function of time is that this is just going to rotate in the complex plane. And this is going to be general rho 0, 1 at time t. And so if I do not know what, state, what time has passed, then effectively the phase can be anything on the circle. Now imagine that I, I'm doing an experiment where you know, I prepare 1,000 copies of some density matrix row, and then I do some operation on it, and then I make a measurement, and I look at the statistics. What are the statistics going to say if I don't have any control over the time in which I did these, these operations? Well, it's going to say, well, effectively, every time you did it, you just picked a random number on the circle. And so if I pick a random number on the circle, and I add up all the statistics, well, because and this is important, quantum mechanics is linear, its evolution is linear, measurements are linear operators, everything is linear, which means that the average of the statistics is going to be the statistics on the average state. So maybe I should write this down. So when we have linearity, which is that a function on, um, if this is a linear function, a function on a v1 plus b v2 is the same as a f of v1 plus b f of v2, then we say that the function is linear. So, right? And quantum mechanical evolution and measurements are linear. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get the average of the state. And the average of this state is essentially a point in the center. So it, it basically takes um, all the phases, and it is going to give me an average of the center of the circle, and the center of the circle is just 0. So if I take a complex number, and I take the average of just rotating it in the complex plane, then I'm just going to rotate around 0, which means that the average of all of those numbers is just the number 0. So if I have no control, or so if I do not keep track of time, so no track of t, then what I get is that rho is effectively 
this state. Row 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, row 0, 1, sorry, row 1, 1, row 1, 2, row 2, 1, and row 2, 2. And so this is why I differentiated between these elements, which I called coherences, and these elements, which are not coherences. Time? Ah, very good. Okay, um, this is uh, break time, apparently. Uh, break time is about 10 minutes? Is that 15 minutes? Okay, very good. So you can take a break, stretch your legs, drink water, and uh, we'll be back at quarter to 11 to continue the course. Thank you. Hello. Check, check. Very good. Um, okay, let's do that. Is this better? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep the other one. All right. Welcome back. Um, Yes, actually, so one um, logistical question, not to decide right now, but you can think about and we'll ask you about it next week or even maybe ask a forum question. So the way it's organized right now is that the lecture and tutorial uh, follow, the tutorial follows the lecture. So in other words, you have teaching from 10 to 2, to two o'clock, essentially, which also goes way into lunchtime. Um, so what we can do is we have a break, of course, in the middle of the lecture, we have a break like 15 minutes before the official time ends, and then you have the official start time of the tutorial and the break in there. We can organize these in such a way, so for example, we could do one of two options. We can make this condensed so that you end up significantly earlier than the normal end of the tutorial time, or the other option is to make it condensed with the lecture and the tutorial sort of apart so that you have a bigger block of time in between the lecture and the tutorial. And so this basically depends on, I don't know, what time your other stuff is and what time you would have to have lunch because it would not be pleasant if at some point at one o'clock you're sitting in this tutorial and your stomach is really killing you because you haven't eaten lunch. So this is something you can think about if you have a clear preference for it and then maybe next lecture we can ask you about it and then from then on uh, adjust it and inform everybody on Moodle as well that the, the timings are slightly adjusted so that yeah, we can do this. So I, I, have, I will always start at 9.45, not before that, but I could the break in the middle and how I end it can be adjusted to, to sort of, yeah, take this into account. Yeah? Sorry? To, well, today, we'll, because people might be following online, I will just follow it as it is. So I will end at, uh, I guess, 11.30, and um, Nuria will begin at 11.45 as, as planned, and then it will end at 1.30 as planned. But you see, this doesn't really give you a lot of op time in between, so... Uh, we could adjust that, yeah. So yeah, so even at the end of this lecture and tutorial, if you already have an idea of what you would prefer strongly, you can tell us about it today and then we can think about it. Okay, um, are there any questions uh, in, that came up during the break about stuff? Yes? Yes, the tutorials are also recorded, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, to continue. So, uh, yes, so let me now talk about uh, operations because so far everything that we've talked about uh, so far has just been about the state. How do I write the state? How do I write the state in the energy eigenbases? Why different elements sort of have different behavior under time evolution? But now I can do the same thing, but for operations instead. So the first thing I'm going to do is I can... I can always write, remember, my Hamiltonian also in the energy eigenbasis as a matrix, so it would look, in this case, it would look very simple. It's just because the energy basis is the basis in which the Hamiltonian is diagonal, you're always guaranteed that, yes? Oh, yeah, this is a question that came up before. I, I do not know how to do it at the moment, so... So there is one, but I don't know whether I cannot press it hard enough or not. It does not. Ah, maybe we don't. Wait, let me just. Yeah, well, at this moment, it appears to be jammed. So I cannot really do anything about it at the moment. <laughs> yeah, but for the next lecture, I will try and uh, <laughs> I will try and deal with this. For now, I. Uh, 
I'd ask you to just shift your head sideways. And yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the very simple form of the Hamiltonian example that I, I just gave. Okay. So now returning to the um, reasoning as to you know why average states uh, might be important. Uh, I talked about, imagine you prepare a density matrix, then you go out of the lab, and you come back, and then you do some operation on it. Now let's talk about this operation. So one example of what an operation might be is that I might come back, and then I might turn on an interaction Hamiltonian. So if I have a qubit, for example, I could do something like shine a laser at it for a, for a certain amount of time, and then switch the laser off. This is one of, well, actually, this is really how people manipulate uh, qubits in many cases in the laboratory. So how would I write this? So I can say, OK, I have a state. Um, let, me, let me use a new board. It might be better. So I'm going to do the, um, well, actually, let me do it left to right first. So I have the state rho at time t is equal to 0. So uh, yeah. And then I just let it, ev it evolve for some time, let's say, um, delta t1. Okay. I'm not sure what this delta t1 is. I'm writing stuff small again, sorry. Delta T1. Then I do an operation, and, and this operation is I turn on an interaction, uh, a Hamiltonian, which is different from the system Hamiltonian, for a certain amount of time. So let's say this is e to the um, minus i h interaction times delta uh, T2. Then I let it evolve again, delta T3. And then I say, well, what do I have at the end? Okay. Now, quantum mechanically, I would say, well, I have the system rho. First, I evolve it under this Hamiltonian, and density matrices are evolved um, in this fashion, e to the minus i. Okay, everything has to be bigger. Sorry, I'm just defaulting to normal size at the moment. So, rho e to the minus i h system delta t1 e to the plus i h system delta t1. OK, so this is the first thing that happens. Then the next thing that happens is I do this interaction, so e to the minus i h int delta t2. I'm going to assume that delta t2 is very small. So, um, or rather, the effect of h system in that time is a much smaller operator than h interaction in that time. So what I'm saying is that this laser that I turn on is so intense that in the time that the laser is on and off, the system Hamiltonian is actually very weak. It, it hardly changes the system. Um, the reason to do that is so that I can actually split this um, without having to write h int plus hs, because otherwise I would have to add the system Hamiltonian plus the interaction Hamiltonian to get the total one. But at the moment, I'm just going to write it this way. Um, and I have the same thing on this side, h int delta t2. And then I evolve for another amount of time. H int delta t3 e to the minus i h int, del sorry, h system delta t3. This is h system. OK, so now what this is going to give me are all of these concatenated to one another. And now I look at this and I say, well, can I simplify this? There is one case in which I can. So if the interaction Hamiltonian that I switched on and off commutes with the system Hamiltonian. So you've learned commutation in linear algebra. This is h int commutes with hs if, is if uh, h int times hs and hs times h int are the same number. And if they commute, then we also know that these exponentials can be joined together. Because if two operators do not commute, then the exponents of those operators, if I take the product, I can also not shift them around. But if it does commute, then I can shift these operators together. So essentially, then, 
the order in which I applied etchint after delta t1 and before delta t3 is sort of irrelevant because if I can shift these into one exponential, then delta t3 and delta t1 will join together, and I can write this as e to the minus i h system, delta t1 plus delta t3, and e to the or plus i, the same thing. Let's just and then e to the minus i h int delta t2 and e to the plus i, the same thing with h int. So this is a very important concept now. If I have an interaction Hamiltonian that commutes with my system Hamiltonian, then when I applied it, does I actually does not matter. The effect of it is the same. If this was not the case, then what delta t1 and what delta t3 individually would matter a lot because it would not, if I change them, I would actually get a different state entirely. But if they commute, then I get the same, the same answer regardless of, of what, what they were individually. Okay, now I chose the example uh, of etchant, but in general you can have more complicated quantum operations. And the concept here that I would like to introduce is the concept of energy preserving quantum operations, and specifically energy preserving unitaries. Ah, oh, it's getting lighter. All right, yes. Okay. I shall switch to this now. This one is also light. Okay. This is why I brought my own markers as well. Okay, that's better. Uh, let me switch to blue anyway. Okay, so energy preserving unitaries. Now, um, recall that a unitary, so this, so a unitary operator is an operator U such that U dagger U is the identity operator. So the conjugate transpose of the operator itself is, um, is its own inverse. So the other way of saying this is U dag dagger is U inverse. Um, there are many ways of understanding it. One is this way. Another way of understanding a unitary operator is the following. Um, it takes an orthonormal basis. So it, so it takes, sorry, takes one orthonormal basis to another, which means you can always write, if you, if you know the, the correct basis transformation that the unitary is doing, you could always write the unitary in this form. It would be sum over i of some basis that you started out with, phi i, and some basis that you ended up with. Let's call this lambda i. Okay. So, for example, for those of you who've done um, the um, QIT course, one very simple unity operator. So, for example, is Imagine that I want to change from the computational basis to the uh, x basis. So I could say this is a unitary operator. 0 goes to plus, and 1 goes to minus. And you see I've written it in this form. I've chosen the basis 0 and 1, and 0 goes to plus, 1 goes to minus. So every unitary can be written in this form. Um, right. The other thing about a unitary, but this is, this is now uh, jumping ahead, is that it preserves entropy. So I haven't defined entropy yet, but it is sort of important already just for the concept to say that if I have a state, a density matrix that has a certain entropy, and okay, those of you who are in QIT, you know what I mean, the von Neumann entropy, for example. If you do a unitary operation on that state, it preserves the entropy. Very good. Preserves the entropy, and actually this is actually a consequence of preserving... Um, preserves the eigenvalues. So because a unitary preserves the eigenvalues of a state, it, so if you have a density matrix and you know what its eigenvalues are as a, as a matrix, you will see that any unitary you, you apply, you will also get the same uh, eigenvalues at the end, even though the basis might change. Okay, so an energy-preserving unitary is one, very simply, that commutes with the Hamiltonian of the system. So if I apply 
a unitary on a system that has this property, then this I call an energy-preserving unitary. And the reason it's, it is useful is exactly the reason I just said there. I can now go back to this example, and I can just call this U, and I can call this whole thing U dagger. So I've applied a unitary operation on rho. And if the operation, the unitary operation is energy-preserving, then the time that passes before and after the unitary operation, it doesn't really matter. All you need to know is the total time, and then, then you're done. It, it, when you apply the operator in between is, is actually not important. OK. But this does not complete the story. So now to complete the story, I return back to the form of the state. And I ask, well, imagine, right, so imagine that I have um, a state of, of this form. Let's say rho effective is rho 0, 0. And all of, all of the coherences, that is the off-diagonal elements between non-degenerate eigenstates, so energy levels which are different, they were all 0. And imagine on, I take this state and I evolve it for a particular time. Well, we already know that all of the time evolution is on the coherences. And the coherences are all put to 0. Therefore, this state is now time independent, and what I will call such states as well is incoherent. So this is a terminology that I will use. A state is incoherent if all of the off-diagonal elements between, between non-degenerate uh, eigenstates is zero. Sorry. Is the sound coming through the speaker still? Yeah? OK. Good. All right. So this is an incoherent state. So now. Incoherent states are automatically time independent because I've set all of the elements that would actually change in time. I just set them to zero, so the state doesn't change. Um, so if I take an incoherent state and I apply a unitary operation that is energy preserving, then not only is the, in addition to the previous analysis where I said, well, delta T3 and delta T1 are unimportant, in fact, delta T1 and delta T3 have no effect at all because the system's own Hamiltonian doesn't change the state. I've picked a state that doesn't evolve anymore. It's time independent, which means that then when I apply the unitary, it's completely irrelevant to, to what state I will get at the end. So all of this in the case of incoherent states, so for incoherent states, all of that, if I, if I had something of the form rho s and e to the minus, oh, say, Writing left to right is sometimes irritating. E to the minus i h um, system some t1, and then a u, um, this, and then, of course, the dagger on the other side, e to the plus i h delta t1, and then a u dagger. This just becomes um, u rho u dagger, because there's no effect of delta t1. So the reason I introduced coherences and the notion of incoherent states in the, in the case of states was to say, well, if I have no uh, control over the time variable, if I do not keep track of when I apply certain operations, then effectively what I'm going to get is as if the state was the one where all the coherences were averaged out and that averages to zero. The same way I can do the same for the operations and say, well, if I have no control over the time variable as to when I apply operations, then in fact the only operations I should apply are those that actually do not care about when I sort of apply these. So the combination, if I take an energy-preserving unitary and incoherent state, is to say, well, actually, um, I have no clock in my laboratory, no precise clock that will actually say, well, you prepared the state at a certain time t, and now when you've applied the operation, we know exactly how much time has passed and exactly how much time passes before the next operation. So all of this is to say that um, in quantum thermodynamics, you can differentiate between the cases, different sort of cases of control, especially with respect to time. And the minimal case, where you say, I do not have any clock in my laboratory, so I do not keep track of time, is to say then, no matter what states I have, effectively what I will be doing is taking the time average of them, because all of the operations will sort of average out, uh, depending on, in each instance of the operation, what time I've uh, actually made the unitary on, sorry. And all of the operations I can perform as well have to have this form, because if I did not have this form, and this I will do in another example now, then that means I would have to have a clock. OK. Is there any question here? There will be an example of a unitary 
coming up next, so that will make this slightly clearer. Yeah, so just as an example of a unitary operation, I could um, do the following. So one of the other properties of a unitary, um, so if u dagger u is given by the identity, it actually follows that you can always find an operator for which u would be the exponent. So you can always say that u is equal to some e to the minus i, some operator, which I will call here, let's say, k, for some Hermitian, Hermitian k. Okay. Um, and this is actually quite, this is a mathematical statement, but it is also, the physics of this is quite important. What it says is, if I have a unitary operation, which is the, a general, the most general quantum operation that you can have, you can always find some real observable that can act as a Hamiltonian that implements it. So for instance, I can, I can split this k into some k0 times t, and then I can say, well, what I, all I have to do is to, to design an interaction that actually has k0. So if I have my laser system or something, it has to actually apply this Hamiltonian k0 for this amount of time t. And then what I will get at the end of my system is this unitary operation. So one such example is, is the following. So imagine I have a qubit, right? And we have, let's say, I'm going to draw the block sphere representation of the qubit. OK, so this is z, x, and uh, y directions. Um, and I can say, well, imagine that I take k0 to be the sigma x operator. So this is now 0, 1, 1, 0. OK, and then I go, well, imagine that I apply this Hamiltonian now for a certain time. So I say e to the minus i, k0, t. So this is e to the minus i. OK. And because this is a Hamiltonian, I'm, I'm sort of putting h bar. Sorry, I should have said, in everything that I did so far, I have not actually written h bar explicitly. We don't need h bar to appear explicitly in thermodynamics calculations. So you know we work in units such that h bar is 1. The same thing is here. So k0 is ac not actually sigma x, because there has to be a unit of t inverse here. So it's some omega sigma x, I would say. And so that this becomes e to the minus omega times t times the sigma x operator. Um, yeah, and so when you, now you, because sigma x is a Pauli operator, I'm not going to do this calculation explicitly, but you can um, actually expand it by using the exponent, um, the expansion of the exponent operator. And you will end up with two parts. You end up with the identity times cos of omega t. This is identity operator plus um, i sine, sorry, minus i sine of omega t with the sigma x operator. Is this correct? Yes. Right. And the effect of such a thing, if you write this now as a density, as a matrix, a uh, unitary matrix again, is you have cos omega t, cos omega t, um, and, oh, sorry, sine omega t with an i and a minus i sine omega t. Sorry, this is a bit wrong because this is going to be a sigma y. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is now a unitary operator here. Okay. And the effect of this is to rotate. So if I start in the state 0, then under the time evolution, this is going to rotate this cos of omega t 0. Um, plus, so if I, minus i sine omega t 1. Okay. I, I, have I made a mistake with the Pauli matrix? Yeah, okay. 
Ah, sorry, yes. Ah, sorry, okay, sorry. Then this is then this is minus i sigma x, and this is uh indeed uh minus i minus i. And this is unitary because when I take the comp let me write this bigger, sorry. I apologize. Cos omega t, cos omega t, um, minus i sine omega t, minus i sine omega t. Yes, and these two are orthogonal to each other because when you take the conjugate of this, you will get uh, a plus there. Yes, unitary. So, and this is going to, yeah, minus i sine omega t1. Okay, and the way to understand this actually in the block sphere is kind of nice. Um, in the block sphere, anytime you have a Hamiltonian that you write in a particular direction of the block sphere, the effect of evolution is to essentially rotate around that direction. So this is, well, this is called precession, uh, even in the classical case. So if I actually choose a Hamiltonian in this direction, so this is now a Hamiltonian in the x direction, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up rotating around the x-axis, which is the same as rotating this is red. Let's put it in a different color. This is the same as rotating in the zy plane. And that's exactly what's happening here. I started at a computational state 0 in the z direction. I get a superposition of 0 with i1. So if I choose, for example, let's say that t is equal to pi over 4, then I'm going to get 1 over root 2, 0, minus i over root 2, 1, which is one of the eigenstates of the y operator. So I've gone from the z to one of the eigenstates of the y. If I make it a more, then I'm going to go into the state 1, and then to the state of minus y, and so on and so forth. OK. So the, the result of this um, example was to say, well, every unitary, you can find a Hamiltonian that implements this unitary. Uh, the way to do it is really just to find the log of uh, the unitary matrix, and that will give you something proportional to the Hamiltonian. And then you can split up that as any combination of the Hamiltonian and, and time, because it's the product that matters and not individual operators themselves. OK. Are there any questions? No? Any clarifications? All right. Very good. Um, so then, if there are no more questions, I can go on to some thermodynamic stuff on qubits. Let's see. I only have 15 minutes. All right, 15 minutes to introduce the virtual qubit. Let's bring this down. Excuse me, this one. Very good. OK. So now I'm going to talk about the notion of a thermal state. Um, and this is a notion which I will define now. And as we go through the course and we introduce the notions of passivity and of equilibration, the thermal state will sort of be justified as to why it should sort of have its form. But for the moment, it's just a definition. So I call a thermal or actually a Gibbs state, named after a physicist. Um, and I'm usually going to label such a state by the letter tau instead of rho. So typically when you see tau, you know, okay, I've taken a thermal state, not just a gen general density matrix. And this is given by e to the... Um, minus h system divided by t. So once again, I put, so it usually should be h system divided by kbt, but again, um, I just work in units of kb also 1, so it doesn't matter so much. And of course, this has to be normalized, so I have to divide by the same, minus hs over t. OK? This is a definition of it. Um, at the very outset, I'm going to say that instead of working with temperature, um, I'm going to work with inverse temperature instead. So usually, I would write this now as e to the minus beta hs upon trace of the same. So beta is really just 1 over kbt. And as a notion of temperature, this temperature becomes clear. You see that it's actually the more natural thing to work with rather than t as we are used to. OK, so simple example. Imagine now I have a qubit. 
and my qubit has a Hamiltonian edge system is just E times um, the state one, right? So this is just, this is the Hamiltonian here, zero and one. Then what is what is going to give us is, so therefore tau is now, I exponentiate this. So if I write things in the energy eigenbasis, it's, it's very nice because in the energy eigenbasis, the Hamiltonian is diagonal. And the effect of exponentiating a diagonal matrix is just to have the exponents uh, of, on the diagonals themselves. So if HS is this, it means that E to the HS is, so this, okay, I can also write this as, as a matrix. This is now 0, 0, 0, E. So E to the HS is just going to be 1, E to the ES, or E, rather, 0, and 0. Very important, the 0 come, gets into a, into a 1 here because the exponent of 0 is 1. So now this is going to become um, 1, 0, 0, e to the minus beta e. And then I have to divide by the trace of this, which is just 1 plus e to the minus beta e. Or going back to you know, notation with bras and kets, this would be 1 upon 1 plus e to the minus beta e, the ground state projector, plus e to the minus beta e, 1 plus e to the minus beta e, the excited state projector. Okay, So this is just the simplest thermal state you can imagine. Um, at the very outset, I'm going to define a few terms that are useful. So I call the Gibbs ratio is the ratio between, so this, know that this element in my previous notation, I would call P1, the population of, and this would be P0, divided, of course, by this. So the Gibbs ratio is going to be P1 upon P0. So the ratio between, so it's basically excited upon ground. And this is just E to the minus beta E. This is a very important factor. The Gibbs ratio is something we've been working with very intensively in the course. So getting familiar with it, I mean, you will get familiar with it as we do more and more examples. So it's very important to pay attention to. All right. So that's the Gibbs ratio. Um, and another way of writing uh, this whole thing is to sort of write down how the ground state compares to the excited state is to talk about the bias. Now, the bias is the difference between ground and excited. Population, so difference between P0 and P1. Uh, and you could write it P0 minus P1, P1 minus P0. I prefer P0 minus P1. So we call it Z is equal to P0 minus P1. And now if you actually um, you see this, yeah. So if you write this out fully, what you're going to get, I'm not going to go through the detail, is tan hyperbolic of beta e over 2? Yes. Beta e over 2. This is just using, I mean, you're going to get 1 minus an exponential, 1 plus the exponential, and it's going to give you cos hyperbolic, sine hyperbolic, etc. So you get tan hyperbolic beta e over 2. Now, in principle, the Gibbs ratio and the bias are interchangeable. I mean, they both are just functions of this product beta e. So at the moment, we wouldn't need both of them. But as I will show you with the virtual qubit case, you will need both. Um, and last but not the least, this function here, and this is something that's not new. You will know this by from classical thermodynamics. The denominator, the trace of the Hamil uh, sorry, the trace of e to the minus beta h s. This is called the partition function, which is a very important. Um, notion in thermodynamics. You can usually get a lot of thermodynamic properties by just working with the partition function alone. Um, very good. So are there any questions at this point? Just definition of the Gibbs ratio and the thermal state? Right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, this is all fine. Because I just have a qubit, 
And so for a qubit, I only have two energy levels, right? So whatever the, um, whatever the ratio of populations between those energy levels is, I can always create a temperature. So imagine I gave you, I gave you a qubit state, <coughs> rho, that is just equal to P0, 0, 0, P1. And I said, what is beta? So what is the temperature of the state? Then what you would say is, well, I, I can always write this P0, P1, 0, 0 in that form. I just have to find the correct beta. And there's a very easy way to find it. Whatever the Hamiltonian of rho is, I just say, well, P1 upon P0 is equal to the Gibbs ratio, e to the minus beta times e of the system. I know P1, I know P0, I know e, because it's a, in the Hamiltonian of the system, I just solve for beta. So what this means is that given a qubit state, it, as long as it's diagonal, so that I have zeros on the, on the sides, I always have a notion of a temperature. Qubits always have sort of an effective temperature under their Hamiltonian. But if I do this now for a larger state, so this is rho of a qubit, but this is now rho prime of a system prime, so, so now a different system, and it has three states. It has P0, there's P1, and there's P2. And I say, what is beta in this case? Um, and the answer is now, this is not very well defined because indeed I'm going to have that this H of system prime is going to be some number. So bring this up. So I'm going to say E naught is zero as usual. Then I'm going to say this has some E1 and this has some E2. So note that when I draw these energy level diagrams, sometimes it's useful to write down what the states are uh, in the, uh, in the en for the energy levels. And sometimes that's kind of self-evident. So I just write down what the energy eigenvalues are. Usually it would be clear because I'll either write a ket or a e. Um, OK, so I have the Hamiltonian of the system. And I have now the populations in these energy eigenvalues. But the problem is that if this was a thermal state, right, then I would have that rho system prime, so if thermal, would be equal to e to the minus beta hs prime upon the partition function. Oh, the partition function has a, is usually denoted by z with a stroke within. That is standard notation from classical thermodynamics. Um, but this would imply, so it would give me something like 0, 0 plus e to the minus beta e1, 1, 1 plus e to the minus beta e2, 2, 2 upon the partition function, which in this case is just going to be the sum of all of these exponentials. So actually, this shows you that the, the usual way of writing the thermal state is in the numerator, you just write all the energy projectors with exponent beta times the energy. And the denominator, you just add up all of those numbers in, to get the partition function. But this would imply that P1 by P0 was e to the minus beta e1. It would also imply that P2 upon P1 is e to the minus beta e2 minus e1, because that is the energy difference between e2 and e1. And the same way for the third one, P2 upon P0 is e to the minus beta e2. And now here's the problem. Here, there is only one degree of freedom, which is just beta, right? Whereas if I give you just, let's say, um, I'm, going to now, I'm going to label this as q0, q1, and q2. Here, I have two degrees of freedom. There are three numbers, but of course, it's not actually three degrees of freedom because be given that it's a density matrix, the trace is 1. So the sum q0 plus q1 plus q2 is 1. However, even after taking out the degree of freedom, there are two degrees of freedom, which means that in general, these three numbers, if they are just pick them arbitrarily, are not going to have these properties. And this is the same as saying if I have a larger dimensional system, I cannot describe it by a single temperature, which makes sense because we know that there are, for complicated systems, there are lots of states that are not thermal states. And this is reflected in the fact that I have a lot of degrees of freedom. However, what I can always do is I can say, given each subspace, qubit subspace, so I have three states, but I can just pick two out of three states. I can, in each subspace, define a temperature. So what I can do, instead of saying, instead of putting all of the ratios as one temperature, I can say, actually, this, well, 
let me do it in a new place so that's not messy. I can say Q1 upon Q0 is e to the minus beta 0, 1, and then e1 minus e0, so this will be just be e1. Q2 upon Q1 is e to the minus beta 1, 2, e2 minus e1, and the same thing, Q2 upon Q0 is equal to e to the minus beta 0, 2, oh, just e2. So this I can always do, because I, for every ratio of numbers and the energy difference, I can just solve for this equation. What I have done here is I've defined a new quant quantity, which I call the virtual temperature. So virtual temperature of the virtual sort of qubit. So in that case, it was between E1 and E2, so that E1 and E2. So here I define two quantities now, um, or two notions. One is the notion of a virtual qubit, which is I take any general system, and I pick two energy levels between them, and I just look at that subspace. That's just called a virtual qubit. Once I look at those energy levels, I look at the populations within those energy levels, and I define the virtual temperature by just taking the, the Gibbs ratio of those populations, the energy difference, and associating a temperature the usual way that I would do so for a thermal state. So this I can always do. And the difference between now a general state and a thermal state is the fact that in the case of a thermal state, all of these numbers, beta 0, 1, beta 1, 2, and beta 0, 2, will be the same. They'll just be one beta. But in the general case, they are not going to be the same beta. Any questions? Yes. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, uh, a th by thermal state, I mean any state that can be written as this form. So exponent of the entire Hamiltonian with a single beta. Yes? Uh, what do you mean? Yes? Aha, uh -huh, sorry. So if, if, um, so this is, this is, this is for a thermal state. If it's not thermal, I cannot write it in this form. So yeah, so if your question is, can I still write it as, exponent of Hamiltonians with different temperatures and different terms? No, we cannot write it. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah? Yes? Aha. This is a good point. So maybe... <laughs> so the thing is, in, in, in works that I've done, I didn't use, need to use a partition function, so I was comfortable calling this Z. Um, perhaps if it is, so I will actually not use the partition function so much, which is why, so there, there will not be confusion of that sort. But the actual technical difference is that here, this is the difference between populations. Um, and, and that partition function is, it's, it's just the sum of all of these exponential terms. So they're, they're just different formulas here. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So I, I will, if it is the case that I have to use z bar the partition function, then, I'm, then I might change this one. But I remember from the last course I didn't have to, so I will just stick to calling this z. Yeah. OK. Um, just to complete it uh, for one, one more minute, I will just now define the same thing. So I've defined the virtual temperatures. Oop, that's not a t. That's an l. Um, and so the Gibbs ratios are defined the same way. But what I can also do is now define the sort of bias in these cases. So I can look at, for example, the, so the biases. Um, actually, you know what? I think this might take more than a minute. So in fact, I would prefer doing this in the next lecture. And I would conclude here. That would, that would be all for this time's lecture. Thank you.